So I guess first I'll talk about what the project is first. So it is a, a sight via sound machine. So every pixel is mapped to a certain frequency and that frequency plays if the pixel is white. Um, so for instance, I'm going to draw a random pixel here and it's just, it's gonna play a sound. This one's kind of low. But yeah, so every pixel maps to a frequency and if that pixel is on, um, it plays a sound. And the way the pixels are mapped to a frequency is by drawing a Hilbert curve over the whole screen. Um, I should have pulled up a Hilbert curve in here. I have one pulled up, but that's not the screen I'm sharing. Um, but yeah, it draws a space filling curve over the screen. And then if you stretch out that Hilbert curve, it becomes sort of the frequency axis. So the lower the Hilbert index of the pixel, the lower the frequency plays. Um, and we'll see in a second how the Hilbert curve is traversed across the screen. Um, and the way it combines all the sounds is we have some uh, DDS things running in parallel in an ISR. Um, so we've built a lookup table for the DDS incrementers, and that is populated whenever a pixel is drawn. So whenever a pixel is drawn, its Hilbert index is calculated, and that is the index of the DDS incrementer table that is populated. So the ISR looks through all of them every time. All right now we have an eight by eight screen. We've downsampled the display and like written our own like draw pixel, draw rectangle functions. Um, and yeah, whenever a pixel is drawn, this table is populated and that is how um, it determines what frequencies to do. Um, and we normalize it so that way uh, we don't overflow the, the SPI channel. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, we actually determined that we don't need a like pixel intensity map, like our, the two by two array that we had, or two dimensional array that we had. Um, because if we just in do the DDS incrementer whenever we draw the pixel, that is also going to serve as kind of the um, image map. Because if that is non-zero, then that pixel is going to be drawn. And when that pixel is cleared, we also set the incrementer equal to zero. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the rest is best demonstrated by just by looking at it. Um, so, and you said, you said you're doing this for images that are eight by eight pixels. Is that, did I get that number right? Uh, yes, uh, we're doing eight by eight right now and we can only support black and white images right now. Okay, cool. So that's, that's eight by eight. So that means 64 different DDS synthesizers. Yeah. Ooh, there's, that's a lot. There's, yeah, there's, there's 64 DDS synthesizers running in parallel. Um, yeah. Um, so first, we're going to, to show you how the screen gets kind of populated by Hilbert index. Um, so it's going, the screen is going to be filled, and there's going to be a lot of sound. It's going to sound really ugly at the end, but so notice the sound gets, the sound that gets added is higher as you go along. So that's how it traverses the screen. That it's kind of spooky. It is, yeah. <laughs> it's it cool. Works. The way um in, in this next demo, it just happened to turn out to be approximately like half steps on a piano. Um, but we just decided to just have the lowest one be a hundred hertz and the highest one be four thousand hertz. So that's it's in the hearing range of most people. And then we determined the steps between each frequency kind of similar to a piano. So we know um, that an octave is twice the frequency of the previous octave. So every half step on a piano is two to the one twelfth times the previous one. And there's 12 steps in an octave. So if you go up 12 steps, it's going to be um, like your base frequency times two to the 12th to the 12th, which is times two, and then you've traversed an octave. So here we know that we have 64 pixels. First one is a hundred. And the last one is 4,000. So in main, we have a frequency lookup table 
that is it starts at 100 and then the next index is going to be um 4000 over 100 times um no no it's going to be times 4,000 over 100 to the one over 64 power. Yeah, because okay. there's 64 steps and we have the start and the end and that determines our ratio. So that, that's what it is for now. Those are parameterizable. Um, and with 64 pixels, it just happens to be approximately half steps. So I was, I was showing this to my roommate who's also a musician earlier and we were like guessing which pixels would make like a chord. So so we did some some really interesting like C chord just by like guessing what individual pixels to draw um, because they just happen to sound really nice and in tune. So that, we thought that was pretty funny. Um, so, so before you move on to the next demo, can I just make sure that I understood that first one? So yeah. what we saw, I, you can correct me if I got this wrong, but what we saw was it started as a, a totally black screen. And then we saw the pixels turn on one at a time and they turned on in the order that you're traversing the screen, which is following this Hilbert curve. Yes. And as each pixel turns on, it's associated direct digital synthesizer also mm -hmm. turns on and synthesizes the frequency associated with that pixel so that we heard frequencies that'll get added on top of frequencies on top of frequencies as you traverse the whole screen. So that, did yeah. I get that right? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, there's another version of that that's a little bit friendlier to the ears and because it, this will only, traverse it but show one pixel at a time so it'll clear the previous one and draw the next one when i run this um in blink mode could i make a request that um i'll let this oh run. we can't we can't hear it i was just going to make a request that perhaps we could meet all mute and then you run it so that we might be able to hear it better yes Very cool. Yeah, so that's how it, it traverses the screen. Um, and oh, this this Hilbert test right here, um, we wrote a whole function that just loops across every Hilbert index, does the Hilbert to Cartesian function, and then does the Cartesian to Hilbert function on the result and just verifies that they're the same, so it maps one to one. We had to do a little bit extra to it to make sure that for any resolution, it starts at the top left and ends at the top right. Um, so there's an additional like swapping of coordinates to do there. Um, so that's why that test is in there. So yeah, well, we have built a couple other demo routines um, for fun and to like show that this project can kind of works um, in that you can hear the pictures. So I'm gonna draw a smiley face real quick. And a frowny face sounds different. It... That's cool. Yeah. And to further kind of illustrate the difference between the positions, um, this one will draw one pixel, which I guess is a, a larger box here, and it'll sweep it uh, horizontally. So once it crosses the midpoint, you can hear the gap, like when there's the lower and it has to go all the way around and get to the higher one. You can also move it here. So there's a little bit less of a gap in like this range here because it traverses it in, in like this kind of order. Really interesting. And we can do the same thing vertically.
So I've found that you can tell the difference between a vertical sweep and a horizontal sweep in parts that have less of a gap in the middle. So just say like a, a horizontal sweep on the lower half of the screen or a vertical sweep on the right part of the screen by just the range. So it might not be the intervals that you have fine tuned um, that you've trained yourself to hear, but if you notice that it, the upper end of it is higher, it's going into the upper right quadrant. Um, yeah. And then our last demo is this kind of interactive one where we can draw a rectangle um, of any size and we can move it around with these buttons. So if you're curious, like what any spot on the screen sounds like. This seems so addicting. It is so fun to play with. Um, and yeah, we can draw like bigger rectangles that start out um, in other places. So there's more frequencies closer together. Um, I think the top middle part of the screen is the, I'm gonna mute this so it's not humming in the background. The top middle I think is the easiest to tell where something is because you hear low frequencies and then really high frequencies and then nothing in the middle. Um, it's difficult to fine tune like where specifically something is especially if you're like moving like up, down, left or right by one because the Hilbert traversal is not like super regular. Um, but after a while, like, you can get the feel of where something is. Um, and, and if you want, like I can try to like guess what's on the screen in real time and like someone else can, can control the demos. Um, by like drawing um, rectangles or like smiley faces or sweeping and stuff. Oh, also so, um, just a, a, the last like couple controls here for this interactive demo. So if we're not in persistent or clear mode, we can move our shape uh, left, right, up and down. Then if we stay in persistent mode, we can draw an additional rectangle. Um, so I'm just gonna draw one in the lower part of the screen and it will stay in addition to, uh, it's lagging a little bit. So it'll stay in addition to this and play a sound. So you'll hear like a big clump of low sounds and then like a middle higher sound when I unmute. So that one smooth high tone is this and then that lower hum is this block right here. And then in clear mode, we can erase whatever this range is. So when we remove this, you could hear the higher sound go away. That is really interesting. Yeah, can, so you, can you explain is, so why did you mm -hmm. choose, there's a number of different shape filling curves. Is there something special about the Hilbert curve that made you choose that? Um, it's the, the only one that I saw like used in any similar projects. And the thing about Hilbert curves is that as you increase the resolution, the position of, and, and assuming that your frequency range is the same, each pixel is going to map to about the same frequency or, or like each location on the screen is going to map to about the same frequency as you increase the resolution. And it's just going to like asymptotically approach some sort of um, like finer grain mapping. So gotcha. if you, so if you do like, an eight by eight screen or like a 32 by 32 screen, like this position, like right here, wherever that is, is going to map to about the same frequency. So you don't need to retrain the ear to do any, um, any different configuration. Uh, so, so if you, if you were to play with this for a long time and get really good at eight by eight images, and then take this and scale it up to say a 32 by 32 image, the yeah. learning that you would have done on the eight by eight is still valuable because of your choice of, of traversal path. Yes, that's the idea. So 
how how good do you think you would be at at discriminating letters? Oh, interest. I don't know. Um, some of them might be easy, like C. Um, if it's like a capital C that goes across here, like you'll hear something high, something really low, and then stuff in between. Um, that's a cool mm. idea. Bruce. With that's, more, that's practice. a whole new flavor of audio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just. I mean, so because that's those are quite abstract patterns, right? They're just mm. they're just symbols representing something else, or or go simpler, just do the integers. The digits zero to nine. Yeah, that, to so be... it would be really interesting. I mean, I think that smiley face demo is a is a good demo because it's really only about two pixels difference, right? Yeah, it's just a few. And to be honest, I can distinguish those two just on where the corner of the mouth is because the eyes are the same, and the only thing that changes is the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I, I'd be able to tell this is a smiley is because you hear the, the right eye is that super high. Mm -hmm. Then I also hear... Ah. Kind of behind it. And that's, I guess, the next highest tone, which is the one my ear catches. But then the frowny... I still hear the super high right eye, but then the next highest one I hear is, I believe would be this one or, yeah, probably this one or this one, which is. Everything here is just kind of mush. I, I can't really, I'm not very good at distinguishing these. Maybe with more practice probably, but. But no. So there's, it'd be a really interesting sort of psychophysical experiment mm -hmm. to just ch change the size of the object and see if you could detect size independent of position and then position independent of size. I mean, that's sort of the, those are two channels that seem like it'd be worth doing. For us to do that, you'd have to have a uh, human studies. Um, the other sort of interesting piece of information that I think is here is because you have these DDS units either on or off, images that are are more white as opposed to black are louder. Is that right? Uh, they should be, but um, another thing I realized, like literally half an hour ago is I think the way we're doing it is because we're indexing into the DDS table for every image. Um, whenever we turn off one of the frequencies, it might get stuck at like the peak of the wave table and that would still get read in. So the, that might, I realized very a short while ago that the intent that won't affect the intensity. No, no, it won't affect the frequency because it's not going to change. Um, but the intensity might get thrown a little bit off by that. But that's a really quick fix. We just need to check whether the um, the incrementer is non-zero before we actually index into the wave table as well. I don't think that matters because it's going to produce a DC level. And, and so you can't hear DC. It's outside your band. Oh wait, no, it's the the amplitude of the wave is all that matters, right? But but not the D okay, never mind then. I think it would um, be just you'd just be moving the waveform up and down, up and down. And non zero. Yeah, yeah, I, so I don't think it matters. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Because there's that a high pass filter on the output of the DAC before it goes to the audio. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's such a cool proof of concept and yeah. you know it makes it makes you sort of scratch your head about like what are other degrees of freedom that you could play with to augment this like this is this is you could imagine a system where left and right channels mean different things and mm -hmm. add dimensionality in that way um 
I don't know what that would represent, color or something, perhaps. Yeah, well, I, could I don't you know how simulate, we do. Could you simulate stereo vision by offsetting with parallax? <laughs> oh, that would be interesting. That'd be very cool. Yeah. Well, this, this does bring up a lot of questions, doesn't it? One of, one of the big ones is like trying to include all those dimensions of color, you know, range, you know, the X and Y kind of thing. Like sound, it's, you can include frequencies, but also to what degree. And what about different like wave shapes? Like having like a sine wave table and then like a, like a square wave or a sawtooth wave table. Cause you could do like, yeah. That's interesting. That. So map intensity to, fr to amplitude and hue to, uh, to a shape of wave or something. something so like reds that, are yeah. really nasty and greens are soothing if you have my sense of vision. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. This is a great project, guys. I mean, it's, it's one of these things that's just interesting in its own right. And then... My God, if you wanted to, it feels like you could do a whole PhD on, on this kind of thing. I mean, I agree. there's I, so much extensibility here that it's amazing. And it's, it's cool just as like a thing of interest. It also, I mean, you can imagine some really practical applications for this kind of thing. Really cool.